Band Designs Live Grand Theatre. Um, it's the last one of the day and uh, it's going to be relaxed and friendly but it's also going to be technically really quite interesting. The idea is low-tech versus high-tech materials. Uh, on my far left is an individual who uh, none of you will not already know, gets himself into a serious sentence structure problems. Uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin and I had a conversation about this particular session before um, you know the show when we were in the preparation stages and he was talking about aerogel and all sorts of you know super high-tech things and Will Stanwix is uh, a natural materials expert his company is called what is it called this year Will? Uh, <laughs> hemp Lime Construct so he does hempcrete and limecrete and all those things that kind of grow out of the ground and turn into mud and then go hard and uh, about which I know almost nothing uh, Kevin, of course, you know, us having had this conversation, Kevin's um, man-made shed then comes on the TV and he's making floors out of cheese and, uh, and cutting down trees and exploding them and all that sort of thing. So I'm thinking, well, this is hardly high-tech materials, is it? However, now you've got your words, would you like to start? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's been written for me and now I can, I'll just read these out, it's fine. <laughs> um, so I go first? You can go first. I think we should have Kevin first. <laughs> And then, Thank well. you. Thanks very much. I'm, this is the first time ever that I've written words down on an iPad, which then requires the iPad to be with me, I realise. I can't just have a piece of paper folded up in my pocket. Um, anyway, uh, I have got some words, and the reason I've got some words is because, ordinarily, uh, when I give a talk on stage, as Aidan knows, I tend to have kind of just be a rehash of something I've done before. So I kind of more or less know where I'm going with it. Whereas this, I put together yesterday and from scratch and had to then write it first to figure out what I was going to say. So it may not go well. Uh, it may go off at a tangent. Uh, so bear with me. But I hope I can communicate what I want to. So anyway, we are in love with the past. That's my first idea that we kind of, um, this idea of the vernacular, the simple, the low-tech, appeals to us. In fact, there was a recent article in one of the big trade building magazines by a surveyor where he suggested that the reason why so many mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, um, air source, heat pump, hybrid systems go wrong in the UK in our houses is because in the UK, unlike in Germany and on the continent, we like our houses to be dumb. Traditionally, we always control our heating by turning the thermostat up to full and then opening the windows and then shutting the windows and then opening them again. That's how we've done it. And in Germany they like to treat their houses like machines and they like to engineer them, whereas we like this kind of thing, which is charming and lovely. Anyway, oh we like this kind of thing too. So we kind of we're, we're a, a nation of nostalgists. Here is some straw. And Will is going to talk about straw, amongst other materials, later on. Uh, here's a straw house. Charming and lovely and tiggy winkle as it is. And here is another straw house. This belongs to the architect Sarah Wigglesworth, who built a highly contemporary building using straw as not just an insulin, but actually as a structural component as part of the building system. My point here, as I'm going to demonstrate with all of my pictures really, is that vernacular, traditional, low-tech materials can occupy a traditional low-tech place, but they have a high-tech place too. So, here's, on the right, an Arabic chimney. It's a cooling tower. And uh, I don't know how you, if you know how these work, but on the top left you'll see there's a termite tower on the top left, up there. And then below it is a sort of diagrammatical version of the termite tower where basically um, warm air in a building rises up a tower and is carried away by the wind and it sucks in cool air from underground, in the ground and that cool air is fed from a duct somewhere else and in passing underground the cool air drops from say 20 or 30 degrees Celsius to around 12 degrees Celsius and lo and behold you have natural refrigeration in the building. You have a building cooling system. Now you might think that's a bit weird and odd, but actually it's been used for hundreds of years across the Middle East, and it's a system which very high-tech but very principled building engineers at Atelier 10, big engineering firm, 
uh, run by Patrick Bellew, a wonderful man, used in the ventilation and design, design ventilation strategy for the new winter gardens in Singapore, which is the most massive building, which is in a, a fairly tropical climate. Uh, it's got a lot of glass in it, and they've used this exact same principle for natural, cooled ventilation of the building, which requires no energy inputs. Exactly the same system is now going into the WWF headquarters being built at Woking, which opened later this year. So this is a really, really old-tech, low-tech, high-tech solution. Now here is some air conditioning units. Now how primitive they seem, don't they, in comparison? You have to pump them full of energy to cool a building, to suck the heat out of the building, only then later on in the year to try and find it to put it back into the building using more energy. Bonkers, wasteful, inefficient, stupid by comparison. Here, here are some ventilation cowls at Bedshead in South London that use exactly the same Moroccan principle that I was talking about. And here are the same ventilation cowls that we stuck on a project that we built in my company have in Swindon uh, on the top of the building. Those are not chimneys, a big pun. Those are not chimneys, they're, they're natural ventilation cowls that in the summer can be opened to allow warm air to rise out of the building, sucking cooler air in at lower level through grills at ground level. Simple way of keeping a building cool in summer, avoiding all that expensive air conditioning. Here is some hemp growing in a field. Hemp is, after bamboo, the fastest growing crop in the world. You can hear it growing. It's the most fantastically productive material. It can be grown in between other crops in the course of a yearly cycle on a piece of land. And here is some concrete in the ground being handled by real men in real hard hats. And here is some more concrete, only this is a lower tech concrete made with lime, around about 100 BC. This is a lump of concrete in Pompeii which is still there two millennia later. And this is hempcrete, which is concrete made with hemp that we saw growing, mixed with lime, rather like the Roman concrete, which is used in these buildings again in the triangle. Another example of a kind of low-tech, high-tech material. I won't go into the phase change properties of hemp, but you will, will, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. So, here's a tree. Here's a building made out of some tree. Uh, here's some tree um, which has been processed into laminated timber and OS board, which forms part of an entire roof made out of tree, which is this roof, which is absolutely blinking enormous, which is the roof on this building, made entirely out of timber suspended on cable. Thanks to timber engineering, we can create extraordinary structures using laminated beams everywhere you can use steel, perhaps, well, except in nuclear power stations, maybe. Uh, everywhere you, where you can use steel, you can use a piece of wood now, more or less. Here's some warmth, and uh, here are some boilers. These are the boilers from the Titanic, big ones, designed to run on coal dug out of the ground and burnt to make energy. Here's some central heating. Only this central heating is 2,000 years old. It's Roman. It's a hypercourse where hot air was blown from fires underneath the floor. By the way, uh, this by the way, this, here's some district heating. These are hybrid photovoltaic panels powering some underfloor heating. It's a high-tech version of the Roman original. And if you think that our power stations are fantastically sophisticated modern machines which have taken us from the steam age into the 21st century. I was reminded the other day by an engineer that every single power station in Britain uses either coal or diesel or gas or nuclear energy to produce heat to boil water to turn it into steam. We've never left the steam age. Here is an ancient wall made out of mud and earth and stone. It's a cob wall. Actually, it's part of a building which is being constructed by Kevin McKay, who is the king of cob. It's his own home. It's going to be a cob castle down in, um, in Tiverton. It's a huge building. And we're filming it for 
a series which we hope to transmit sometime in the, ne in the next decade. Um, uh, we're not, it's not quite finished yet. Um, but this is a, a, a wall with enormous thermal mass. It's made out of earth and stone and a bit of straw. And here's a modern earth wall, because concrete has got stone in it, like cob, and it's made out of clay, and it's made out of chalk or lime. Now, that's cement, it's made out of sand. It's got exactly the same materials in it, really, as the cob, except that the clay and the lime have been heated, and it's a rather important in being heated together to make the super-performing cement that it's produced a, a ton of carbon dioxide for every ton of, um, of cement produced. But nevertheless, all the materials with which we build on the planet are fundamentally dug out of the ground, because that's all we've got in terms of resources to use to build with. And whether or not they're cob or cement or concrete or hempcrete or limecrete really depends on the amount of energy and the amount of ingenuity which goes into processing those materials. Uh, this is a big uh, wall made out of stone, except, although it looks very low-tech, this is a, from one of our previous projects, it's a tromb wall. The word tromb kind of gives it away, trombone. Imagine a giant trombone a mile and a half long, threading through this wall, filled with water, pushing its way through the wall, storing heat in that wall, and then picking the heat up later in the year. That's what a trom wall is. It's a big storage tank for heat, using the thermal mass of the stone and using water through it. It's a really, really high-tech solution, but at the same time, really low-tech. Oh, and, and here's a clay wall, which you can see on that stand over there. Now this clay wall uses cardboard and clay to produce a plasterboard which is about as, as powerful in terms of its thermal mass as a piece of cement or concrete about that thick, about 50 centimetres thick. So it's a very powerful addition to a roof. It absorbs moisture and lets it release slowly. It absorbs heat and lets it release slowly. It's an innovative product. And, and by the way, they also produce one with phase change molecules in it from BASF which makes it one of the most high-performing, high-tech materials on the planet, and it's made out of clay and cardboard. So what's my point there? Well, I've got four little points. First off, some of the most innovative stuff that is happening on the planet actually hybridizes low-tech and high-tech. Secondly, fossil fuels have, for about 80, what, 80, 90 years, yeah? They have made us lazy because they're very cheap, and they're easy, and they allow us to be enormously wasteful. And they make our technology inefficient as a result, and that's changing. Third, low-tech is not necessarily a priori good. I mean, you think about um, 18th century dentistry, for example. And equally, high-tech is not necessarily bad. You need to think of what prosthetics can do. Fourthly, it's not ideas or technologies that, which are low-tech or high-tech that matter, really. It's not, that's not the distinction we should be looking at. I believe the distinction is, what matters is, is how efficient we are and how we value what we've got in terms of resources. And we only have, as I mentioned, we've only got the resources that we have on this planet. We can add all kinds of energy to those resources, but the most valuable form of energy and the most sustainable form of energy that we can add to our materials is that it's human energy. That and that, the hand and the eye, our genius, our creativity. And um, so consequently, I'm going to shut up now and I'm just going to show you a series of images that I put together a couple of years ago for a presentation which kind of play with that idea about value. And they are grouped into a number of materials. So the first one is stone. I like that one. I like this one more. That's stone. This is plastic.
then wood. It's the same tree, by the way. My local underwoodsman does not look like that. And then metal, finally. Great photo. That's the M25. Tonight. And finally, oh. thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. So, essentially, what we're saying is that there's no such thing as high tech or low tech materials, that it's just about how they're used and the context in which they're used. Is well, I right? think the distinction is a little bit, it's a little bit of a red herring, because, you know, the, the, the materials have materials are materials. And you can, you know, you can build a hempcrete wall, and, as I did, and you can overorder, as I did, and end up with four bags of it left over. And that doesn't seem to me to be very ecological, you know, that you end up wasting the product. Um, you can be really, I mean, people put in, for example, low-tech, uh, high-tech um, foundations using screw piles and cement grout, which uses very small quantities of the cement, but it gives them a very strong fix. So there's, you know, it, inevitably, everything we do has some kind of impact in terms of resources, in terms of use, in terms of energy. And it's about, I think it's about understanding the whole life cycle of products and understanding their contribution. And if we can get stuff sourced locally, and if we can get it sourced relatively inexpensively, and if we can use it efficiently, then we can start to play with the, the componentry of materials far more cleverly than just simply ordering another 50 tons of concrete. One of the things I was... I was um looking for us to discuss was the way that high-tech actually supports a, a, an eco or a low-tech um, project, you know, the, 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 the way that technology and um, ecology, if you like, or very low-tech ecology, the way that they interact and in, in some cases sort of support each other and help each other. But that may not come out in this presentation. Yes. Will, would you like to yeah, sort of work? Mud? Other more exciting things. <coughs> uh, like Kevin, I also have some words, but because I'm not as successful as him, mine are written on the back of some card, whereas his are on an iPad. But never mind. <laughs> you can have an iPad as well. Really. <laughs> next time, next time. But I'm going to talk a bit about um, low-tech materials, and especially uh, natural low-tech materials. So low-tech materials uh, are found all around us. Um, you can see them in the, the uh, local vernacular, the historic buildings that we see every day. And we can learn things uh, from these buildings since they're the cell-selected best of the bunch and that they're still here 200 years later, two, two, 300 years after they've been built. They use uh, simple design solutions and simple low-tech natural materials. The, the most common phrase you'll hear about uh, low-tech natural buildings is uh, a good hat and a good pair of boots. The good hat, both referring to the way they keep the walls dry, the good hat being a good eaves overhang, and a good pair of boots being a plinth to keep the, keep the building off the ground. Local vernacular buildings also use, uh, make the best of what they've got. You see in this building here, uh, you've got stone, masonry, cob, timber frame, bottle and door, all in the same area. This building uses a swept valley uh, where they may not have had lead or other sheet materials to create the valley. Oops. This building makes its internal walls entirely from waste materials from the site. This was discovered in a, uh, a refurbishment project in Oxford and it's essentially a basket, a uh, basket of timber full of um, waste stone, cob, uh, and other mortar from the site would have just been plastered over afterwards and you wouldn't have known what it was made from. So I'm not saying we should make all our buildings exactly how they used to. Obviously they weren't very well insulated, they were very drafty. But we can adapt their low-tech materials and their 
their low tech design for, for, uh, for modern purposes. Uh, obviously, modern purpose now is a uh, better insulation and uh, lower reliance on uh, uh, energy. This building here, uh, the bottom the door, which would have been the infill panels there, have been replaced with hempcrete, making the building a lot more thermally efficient. Taking the same two materials in a new build, this is an oak frame, which has been completely wrapped in hempcrete like a tea cosy, reducing the thermal breach and creating a much more airtight building. So the, the natural low tech materials they used to use are stone, stone masonry, lime in uh, lime plasters, lime brick floors, timber, timber frame, obviously still using timber frame, roof construction, floor construction. Hemp used to be used as a uh, fibre to reinforce plasters. Nowadays we mix it with lime and make hemp cream. Animal fur or wool um, used to be used horse hair and goat hair to re get to reinforce plasters. Nowadays sheep's wool for insulation. Clay has been used in many forms, uh, tiles, clay floors, cob. Uh, nowadays we make clay boards, uh, clay bricks and clay blocks. Straw used to be used as a reinforcement, or still is used as a reinforcement in cob and clay plasters, but um, nowadays uh, also in straw bale building. And all these materials uh, are sourced, can be sourced locally, and they don't, there's not high embodied energy in their manufacture or, or processes that you're getting at them. Stone can be quarried straight from the ground, timber from forests throughout the UK and Europe. Straw harvested in the UK. Hemp uh, grown in Yorkshire and also throughout the south of England. Sheep, sheep wool from sheep from Wales from the UK. And even more locally, dug from your back garden. Uh, this is in um, Essex. A couple of weeks. These pictures were taken a couple of weeks ago, repairing a, a historic timber frame building. The clay was dug straight from the ground. Sift to remove the larger stones, mixed with clay, uh, sorry, mixed with chopped straw and water to make a base coat plaster to go on to hand split laths. So low tack materials, low tack natural materials work passively, meaning they don't need any energy input to work. They store heat and they insulate. Uh, using thermal mats and natural fibres for insulation. A building that uses thermal mats as well as lightweight insulation would be a more efficient building, a certainly more efficient building. Uh, materials with thermal mats like stone, cob, hempcrete have the ability to store heat in times of high heat, like during the day in the sun when the, when the um, heating's on, and then release the excess heat they've stored uh, when there's, like during the night which gives a more constant temperature overall. Lightweight materials can't do this. So, so a modern house built with timber frame and lightweight materials can't store any heat in the, in the building. It's all stored in the air, which can be easily lost when opening the windows, opening the doors. And also it means there's a greater differential, differential between day and night temperatures. And it's a bit like going on a journey in a car. If you're going on a stop, start, stop, start, stop, start journey, you're going to use more fuel and if you just cruise at constant temperature on the motorway, that's tech constant temperature, <laughs> constant speed on the motorway. Natural low tech materials also passively regulate humidity. Your clay plasters, your lime plasters, hempcrete, cob, they have the ability to take in excess moisture when, when you're cooking, when there's a lot of humidity in the house. And then when it's dry in the house, they'll, they'll give out the excess moisture. Again, giving a, a, a more constant level of humidity, which is uh, healthy for the occupants. Low temperatures always also manage water egress and, and manage moisture generally um, through the breathing wall concept. When we talk about breathing walls, we're not talking about flow of air through the wall, we're talking about moisture vapour. So, materials such as cob, stone with lime water, or hempcrete. They allow the passage of excess moisture through the wall and to escape to the outside. 
which means you specify the building in that water can't get trapped in there causing any problems. Uh, through these, the way they act, they ensure a good indoor air quality passively through natural ventilation. Because you're storing heat in the actual fabric of the building rather than the air, it means you can rely on natural ventilation uh, and also you've not, not got a huge amount of uh, moisture in the air because you're regulating the humidity as well. So you can rely on natural ventilation, opening windows, triple vents, that sort of thing, rather than having a big mechanical ventilation system. They do all these and they also take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So your straw, your hemp, um, your flax, uh, your reeds, all these materials that we use in construction are literally taking carbon dioxide out of the air to grow and then you're putting them into a building the next year, sometimes the same year, where that, that carbon dioxide is going to stay and not going to be released. And so you know, people talk about carbon capture and, and building big buildings to, to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it in the ground. You think, well, there's a much more simple way of doing this just by growing hemp and building hemp free houses. And you have a useful house at the end of the day as well. As well as this, they're 100% renewable, reusable, and recyclable. On the, the pictures you saw with the clay plastering, we also used the 300 year old clay plaster off the wall that had fallen off the wall, mushed it up with a bit more water, blasted it straight back onto the wall, worked, worked a tree. So I would say that lo the, the way in which the, all these low tech materials come into a building, the way they work is actually very high tech because you couldn't get man made material to do all these things. As an example, this uh, garden office stores almost three tons of carbon dioxide in, uh, in, the, in the hempcrete, it's a hempcrete. This one, almost three and a half tons of carbon dioxide. This new mood house, which is nearing completion, uh, well, next week, uh, almost nine tons of carbon dioxide, and that's only half built hempcrete. So, from the NACLA buildings, we can take simple design, low tech materials, and adjust them to make them suitable for modern construction. Your solid timber becomes eye joists, your, your lath, uh, lath and plaster becomes reed or clay board, your cob becomes clay blocks, and your waffle door becomes hempcrete. High tech materials can do fantastic things, and there is a place for them. But in today's world, we do well to learn from the past, stop relying on the next new technology, and use simple, low-tech, natural, healthy, low-embodied energy materials to clean up the future. And this is just a little plug for a book that myself and a colleague are writing. <laughs> the Hempcrete book will be out next year. Thanks. So um, if we, let's bring it back to what I would imagine a good number of people in the audience are uh, trying to do. Some will be working on restore or refurb you know, projects of, of existing buildings. Others have been looking at new buildings. Are we saying that traditional materials are always the better choice, in, even in new buildings, in you know, comparatively modest domestic scale buildings? Is it always the case that concrete concrete can be better than concrete? What about aerogel that you got me so excited about? You don't mention it, have you? Yeah, I that's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there's well, got to be well, some advantage. Okay. So, so, so if you're going to build a basement and you want it to be waterproof, you, you don't want to build it using wood or, for that matter, hempcrete no, definitely not. or a breathable material. <laughs> you want to use a, a highly waterproofed concrete that's reinforced and, you know, the same goes for for many structures, like nuclear power stations. So um, it's about the appropriateness of materials. But what I very start with, with Will's presentation is it's this point about the fact that a hempcrete, for example, is breathable. That is, it allows moisture to pass through it. It's got good thermal mass. It's got good insulating properties. You build a house with walls 350 mil thick, and you can create an airtight building that requires no more wall construction plastered on the inside and rendered on the outside with lime in both cases, that's it. It's, it's straightforward and yet it performs in so many levels that if you were to build it in a building out of timber, we'd require layer upon layer of, of adding materials to it, uh, you know, membranes and, and, and 
and so forth. So uh, I think uh, it's always horses for courses, but I, I think what you're right though in, in, in implying that so often we go to the default, which is plasterboard, pink plaster, you know, concrete. Because it's often uh, easier, isn't it? It's it's quick, it's quick, it's quick and it's easy, and it makes it flat and flush and it joins up. It's all about making systems work rather than thinking about what is appropriate and healthy. And there's a, if there's one thing about natural materials which I think is appealing to me personally, living in an old building that's made out of these things, it is the way in which they're, they're generally healthier places to be. So as, as far as um, the sort of vast majority of modern homes being built, which is actually the building industry, there's a great job to do to get the building industry interested in hempcrete and minecrete, or, or is it already? Well, a, a lot of the mainstream building industry is all, the, the trouble is it's all product based. Yeah. And a lot of the natural materials, apart from hempcrete, a lot of the natural materials, straw, bale, cob, and, and all these sorts of things, there's, there's, not, there's not a product. They're not, products, they're not a product, no. and there's no one with a lot of cash saying, come and use our product. Right. Uh, and even hempcrete's not quite there yet either, yeah. because it's essentially not a product, it's hemp and lime, and, yeah. and a bit of cement in some cases. So you can, you can mix it yourself. So it's, uh, I think that's the problem with mainstream buildings. It's all product based, it's all big firms saying, come and buy this, come and do this. And it looks unlikely, doesn't it, that culturally that the building industry is going to be able to make that shift. So is it going to remain then in one ops and self-build the, the uh, natural materials? Possibly. Well, one, yeah, well, one of the construction industry is very conservative. Yeah. Two, it takes forever to get an agreement certificate for a product. Go to Switzerland, you get an agreement certificate for cob and for straw bale construction. Here, the local authority building control officers are sceptical about materials which don't have agreement certificates, and mortgage companies will not lend it against yeah, yeah. those materials. Yeah, yeah. When we committed to building out of hempcrete in Swindon, yeah. um, we the product did not have an agreement certificate, and uh, I don't actually know what an agreement certificate it, is. It's a pre listed government approval piece of paper that says it's pucker, and mortgage lenders think, great, we can lend against that. It's, it's, it's a sort of certificate of approval, basically. It takes forever. And, um, but Ian Pritchett, the owner of, um, of the company, said, don't worry, we're in the process. We're pretty confident in getting it within the next six months. Well, luckily we did, and luckily so we were able to go ahead. Even then, our housing association partner said, the next thing we do together, we will not be using this material. Not because it doesn't work, but because we feel uncomfortable about having more than a certain percentage of our housing stock constructed in one material, which is semi-proven. We don't know what's going to happen to it in 50 years' time. Isn't it like the oldest building material? Well, it's one of, yeah, it's pretty, it, so. it's, it's pretty established. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's, it's only natural to face that degree of conservatism within the construction industry. And I'm afraid that's simply, that's how it is. And that we have to kind of work deeply and work with local authority building control officers to kind of get them to take on and set some precedents. I think also if, if, if um, if you have to price in embodied energy, you know, in the future, say you have to price in embodied energy to a material, you know, then your natural materials are going to be far more, I mean, they're going to be a lot cheaper. So, so that's another thing that, that in the future might push these sorts another, of materials. Another cultural change, behaviour change things. So, um, just a brief sort of straw poll. Many of you, any of you engaged in building projects, just about to, just finished, in the middle of, any size whatsoever? There's, there's two there, and it's not with their hands up. So yeah, anybody know. building a wind tower? <laughs> and is anybody considering, or at least debating, you know, whether they use straightforward concrete or hempcrete or doing the low-tech, high-tech thing? Is that, a, is that a, an open um, debate in your mind about whether you're choosing as you go forward in your project? Uh, that needs a proper answer from somebody, which means that whoever's doing that thing, there's a gentleman here, Richard. If you could, uh, could you tell us about what your what your life is like, sir, when it comes to building materials? Well, I've been having uh, an insulation project on a wooden house where we put wood fibre in with bats, with wood fibre boards, and then live plaster. Um, we thought for a long time about what we were doing. We were concerned about doing the house with plastic. Closer. Oh, it's not going to bite you, just a little bit like that. Right. Anything else you need to know? Or is that, should I explain it again? 
So, no, again, so you were saying you debated about plastic versus... Yes, but basically my parents have a wooden house, a sort of timber frame with cedar planning, and it has a cavity, but you can't really fill it because it might explode if you use a foam stuff. And we didn't really want to seal the house because it's obviously designed to breathe. So we worked on it for a while and we kind of decided to put wooden, uh, wood fiber mats inside and then wood fiber board on that and lime plaster onto that to create a breathing wall. So I went to a course last week to learn to do the lime plastering. And, and so was that, was that the only solution or was it the, a solution that you decided on a, I guess you could say, emotional basis really? I think we decided on it, it seemed like the best solution. There were others, but it just seemed like the right thing to do with the house. Yeah, it's a philosophical solution rather, yeah, rather than an emotional one. Yeah. Sorry, Kevin, it's philosophical. Uh, we were worried about moisture if we uh, put in something else and putting back the virus around the whole house and things like that, which would be all the yeah. Those timber, uh, timber insulation bats you put on also have, for a lightweight material, they have quite a good thermal mass as well. So they're a good choice if you've got a, a timber frame house with, with no thermal mass. Using a, 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 one of these timber fiber insulations is better than using something like sheet tool because the, the timber has a little bit of thermal mass with it as well. Now, now there's an interesting point because I went to visit the Baufritz factory in Germany a few years ago and they make houses out of timber skins, external and internal, solid skins, and their insulation is about 350 millimeters of wood fiber waste from their factory and the surrounding carpentry factories. That's all they use. It's a fantastic tool because it's insulative. It gives, it adds to the thermal mass of the building. However, they can't use it in the UK because it doesn't need approvals here. And it's a classic example of, of the Germans being really ahead here, really, you know, forward thinking, and the UK market being a little bit behind. There's another product. Let's talk about high tech versus low tech. There's another product made by a company called Pavitex. It's called Pavadentro. It's a wood fibre board. It's used for insulating, and in Germany it's used for retrofitting. And you stick it on with a lime-based adhesive plaster, and you plaster it with lime-based adhesive. And it's like the bat. It comes up to sort of 40 or 50 mil thick. It's got in it a starch-based layer, which makes it hygroscopic, so that it absorbs moisture and then slowly releases it, rather like sheep's wool or hemp. And it's a, a really clever example of somebody thinking hard about What's the waste material? How can we use it? How can we use a relatively natural complementary material in it to increase its performance, to turn it into really what is a really high-tech performing product, but it's very low-tech in terms of its materials. Um, anybody else with questions for Kevin and or Will? Wave your arm, Richard, will come to you. There's a, a lady here, Richard. <coughs> for the uninitiated, could you explain a breathing wall? How does the moisture go out and come back in? Any drawings for this? It's, uh, it's about relative, simply, it's about relative humidity. So with a wall that's made out of lime, moisture can slowly work its way through the wall. And yes, it can go both ways. But if you heat a building, you're introducing warmth into the air, and the warmer you heat that air, the more moisture that air can absorb and consequently you end up with buildings with very high levels of internal humidity relative to the external humidity in the cooler air outside. Which means that if you don't allow that moisture to migrate out, you end up with a planet clammy interior with condensation problems for example. And equally in traditional buildings which tend to have breathable floors, you, you get a lot of, you get a lot of gentle rising of moisture through the floor slab or through the walls. Consequently, you get very high levels of, of, of moisture entering that warmer air inside. And you can get very humid interiors in old buildings. And so if you, for example, skin an old building with modern plasters or put a, an outside modern render using cement on that building, you're effectively trapping those very high levels of moisture in the building. They can't go that way. Admittedly, on a warm day, outside in a derelict old building you might sometimes find condensation on the inside from cool sorry that might go the other way you find yeah co colder um, higher levels of moisture humidity outside than you do inside the interior around 
Does that answer your question? Good. <laughs> do you want to answer that? Will is so sure well, he's going to write. Do you want to write something, Bill? No, no, I mean, the, it's a hard concept to, to get across in your mind. Yeah, I see, you can understand it. But uh, most of the breathable walls, I mean, you're talking about something, uh, a brick wall with lime water or, um, you know, hemp cream with a, with a lime binder. And there's little particles of lime called free limes that, that can move that, that, that can move freely within the um, you know within the structure, and they will, they will actually carry moisture vapor from one side to the other. But it's not it's not moisture droplets or, or streams of water that run through. It's mainly moisture vapor that can the molecules that can go. And, it, and it's just like imagine if you had your your hand in a paper bag taped up, and your other hand in a plastic bag taped up. Your hand in a plastic bag would be full of water and would be sweating, whereas in the paper bag, it, the vapor is allowed out and your hand would be fine. And it's like, you know, you think, oh, how does moisture to get through the paper bag? But it's not in natural materials, it, it just does. So it's like, yeah, there's the science of it. Yeah, it just does. It just does. It's Gore-Tex fabric. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, this is about Gore-Tex, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so there's high-tech, at least. Gore-Tex building. Time for one more, one more, one more quick question. Uh, while we're waiting, so I'll just tell you about aerogel. There's no time for questions anymore. Go on, Philip. Aerogel was invented by a man who set himself the task of wondering what happens to a gel when you evacuate all the fluid from it. It becomes, it becomes a lattice structure. Aerogel is a, is, a, is a super lightweight lattice structure. I don't know how they do it. It's a kind of strange process. Anyway. It's super high performing. It's the kind of ridiculously expensive space age product that nobody could afford, except a friend of mine wanted to make some passive standard doors, super insulated doors, out of timber that looked like a traditional oak door for a traditional house. But they wanted it super insulated. The only way they could do it was to use this aerogel blanket, which is five, eight millimeters thick, but equivalent to about, you know, 200 mil of rock wool. And then I put a sliver of this in a tiny void in the middle of the door. And it's, it's kind of one of those products which just occasionally comes into its own. I mean, I, th I think it's, hard, it's certainly hard for me, but p possibly for us all, to think that, you know, what is this, basically mud and straw can work better than the results of all this amazing chemistry and, you know, scientific innovation and all that stuff. And it, is this actually what we're saying? That given the context, clearly, you know, there are some contexts in which high tech uh, is really only going to be a little thing, but otherwise, is it low tech all the way, Will? Is it natural materials all the way? That's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. It can, it, can, it, can, it can work beautifully, efficiently, and elegantly because it does so many more things. My only other point is that aerogel started by the sand. You know, <laughs> Glass windows in your shed. Good. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Stamets and Kevin McLeod. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, they might be here for a few minutes if you want to nail them, but I suggest you move fast. <laughs> <laughs>